I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com and here today with me is Kara Solway, Chief Market Strategist at verifiedinvesting.com. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to have you here. Well, great to be back, Charlotte. Thanks for having me. Of course. And it's only been it's been a few months since we last spoke. We checked in at the end of December, but so much has happened. So we really have a lot to go over today. And where I thought we would start as usual is with gold. So when we had that conversation all the way back in December, I asked you if the gold price move was real. And you said yes. And of course, we've seen gold continue to move upward since then. But I'm still seeing really a lot of hesitation among investors to believe in it. So I want to check in with you again to get your take on gold's price move. Yeah, so and that's that's a great point. I, I do still think that there's a lot of investors that just aren't used to viewing gold as a kind of as as something that you can make a lot of money being long, right? I mean, it's been something that's since 2020 until the recent breakout, it's just gone sideways, chopped while the stock market was returning massive amounts, right? But now we are starting to see that rip higher. So let's take a look at the gold chart here and see what we have. So so the first thing to keep in mind is that the, the signals on the chart were absolutely there. And what do I mean by that? Well, we had the 2020 high here. And if we draw a trend line across, look at how it kept on hammering on that resistance line. And ultimately that becomes like a doorway, right? You keep on pounding the door until it finally breaks through. And then you get this explosive move to the upside. And that's what we've gotten here. Now, having said that, do I think gold eventually goes higher? Yes, I think 2,500 this year is a lock. Um, I even think 3,000 over the next 12 to 18 months is definitely a possibility. But I do want to just mention here, and I'm, I'm a shorter term investor and trader, so I do want to just mention that I do anticipate a pullback before it goes higher now. And I want to show you guys where I get that from. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip over to the monthly chart. And I use technical trend lines. It's kind of my go-to move. So if we take the high of 1980 right here, which was an explosive high during a high inflation period, and we take that and connect it to our high from 2011, it takes us exactly to the current highs on gold. All right. So again, while I still think gold has more upside, you have to respect a trend line that goes back 40 plus years that we probably are due for some sort of pullback. I even think we could get a pullback to about 2075, which was that breakout level. But basically, I'm just in the position, Charlotte, where pullbacks are buying opportunities. I, I don't see a way that the Fed can get out of lowering rates when the economy gets messy, where they, they're not going to print money, where the government... I mean, how does the government pay down a debt when the interest alone is north of a trillion dollars? That's just the interest, right? So all of these signals point to a Fed that it's going to have to push interest rates down at some point, and it likely means that gold does go a lot, lot higher. Yeah, that was exactly where I wanted to go. I think gold price drivers, it's always great to take a look from a technical standpoint, but of course, good to look at those other external things. So with the Fed, it looks like this year, we're definitely looking at rates coming back down. I think everyone's agreed that's going to happen in 2024, but it seems like the timeline for that is getting pushed out. So curious to know when you think the Fed might start to cut and what the trajectory might be this year. Yeah. So, and this is such a great thing because there's so much kind of questioning about when we will get that kind of big first cut. Is it going to be in June? I mean, I still remember at this time last year, people were already anticipating three rate cuts last year. And then before you knew it was no rate cuts, but six this year. Now it's down to three and it's almost down to two at this point. So it's really been a change. And that's all because, in my opinion, the labor market has remained strong. But also, we've seen inflation beginning to uptick again. In fact, really some incredible charts here. I want to just show you guys some various charts um, that we have on some of these commodities. So let me show my screen again, and we can delve into this. So we looked at gold, and gold's had a huge move. But we know that silver, silver's also had a major breakout, and silver is partially an industrial metal. So we know that that's also very telling about kind of the prices that are going to be passed to investors down the line. We look at copper, right? Copper's had a major move as well, where you've now surged to the upside. And we're trading at levels we have not seen since 2023. And we're actually at a pivotal point here where if we break this on copper, we could be headed back to $5 on copper, which would be remarkable. And then, of course, how could we not mention chocolate, right? The, 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 the chocolate chart 
explosive move to the upside here just since the beginning of the year up over 100%. And one of the favorites for most people is coffee. Look at co coffee's recent move here to the upside. So, so to be honest, you know, we look at these signals and if commodities are going up, it's eventually going to get passed to the consumer. And it's hard for me to imagine how we are going to get inflation back to the, the supposed Federal Reserve goal of 2%, right? And again, you know, I think they're going to move the goalpost. They're going to say, oh, well, you know, 3% during a bad recession is okay. And they'll, they'll start cutting and printing at that point, which ultimately we just are going to have to pay for later on with higher amounts of debt in the system and higher inflation. It's unfortunately, to summarize, it's kind of like a snowball rolling down the hill where it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's no end until that snowball smashes into a, 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 a brick wall, if you will, and just collapses. Yeah, what, what a visual to give us there. No, no, that's okay. That's okay. So talking a little bit more about the Fed. So as you said, you know, these this rate cut has been pushed further and further out. I'm wondering, you know, once it eventually happens, what does it look like coming back down? Because I think I, I used to hear from people, you know, it will come down steadily in the same way that it went up. Now I'm starting to hear a little bit of a different take of it will come down, you know, very quickly, like in like an elevator, I guess. So what are your thoughts there? Yeah. So, so it does seem more and more like it's going to be kind of when the stock market finally has a big flush, when the jobs market, it, you know, it, it doesn't seem as much that people are saying, oh, the jobs market is just going to slowly weaken. It's more that you're thinking at this point that it's going to hit a wall and then you're going to see unemployment start to spike dramatically and the non-farm payrolls number is going to go dramatically to the downside. So I think, I think that's kind of the vibe most people are getting. And I actually think that that's fairly true. I think the signals for slowdowns are, you know, are there in the charts. In fact, I, I want to show you a couple key articles that I've written recently that really speak to the trouble in the system that a lot of the mainstream media is not pointing out. So this was an article I wrote just earlier today, and it and the headline speaks for itself. But basically, credit card delinquencies are surging, and we're at ten percent. And to put that in perspective, you haven't seen ten percent since really going back to the COVID pandemic major catastrophe, right? When everyone was panicking. And then before that, you have to go all the way back to 2008, 2009. So what this tells me is the consumer is feeling stretched. If they're delinquent on their credit cards, they're unable to pay their credit cards. They've kind of run out of, out of room here. A couple other articles that I think are worth taking note of here. Let me just scroll down and I apologize for this. But another headline that I came across, commercial bankruptcies have jumped 43% just in the last year. That's massive. That's telling you that businesses are not doing as well by far. And then just one more here, insider selling spikes to the highest level since 2021. And again, we know 2021, that was when we saw the stock market peak last time. And insiders, again, were dumping like crazy, and they are dumping like crazy here. In fact, there's a great chart here on, on this I want to show you. Look at all that red, and look at how tiny the little bits of green are. Those are insider buys, the green, and obviously the, the reds are sells. So, so again, you know, for me, I look at this and I say, you know, the mainstream media is pointing out how great things are and how strong the economy is ma being maintained. And then I look at things and I say, wait a minute, that might not be the case, right? Maybe we're actually seeing some other factors here that are actually struggling or we're seeing struggling within the economy. So, so I would just, you know, caution people to be aware of this. Um, you know, just a couple and, and bear with me because I think this is so important for investors to see. But if we go down to some of these charts here, number one, the Federal Reserve, or I should say the government, is one of the key hirers. So last Friday, we saw the, the jobs report talking about 300,000 jobs were created, right? Well, look at, look at the amount of hiring that the government's doing. Basically, the government is hiring a majority of these people. And then also other scary tactic uh, signals are that the full-time work has actually been declining the last, four, the last three to four months while part-time is making up the difference. So people are having trouble finding full-time work, and that, again, is an issue. So, so again, not to ramble on, and I apologize for that, but there are so many signals within the underlying economy that things are not so good, but the headline numbers are still relatively good, and I think people have to pay attention to what the underbelly is saying. Yeah, no problem at all. I, I love all the concrete examples and, and sharing them there. So, I think definitely then another point to follow up on is recession in 2024. And 
I think that, again, the last time we spoke, you were calling for a recession in 2024. The question was kind of the size and the depth of that. So do you have any any insight now on how it could look? Yeah, so I am in the camp that by the end of this year, we do still see that recession hit. Now, again, you, you'll see initially, so, so the way recessions work is that it's only kind of once we're in the recession, uh, a little ways in that people start to say, oh, look at the data, because the data is always backward looking. But I think if you asked a lot of people out there, they would say, yeah, you know, things are already tough. And some of these data points we talked about are already telling us that a lot of people are feeling like it's a recession. So so I think that's important. Another thing to just keep in mind is I just want to show the S&P chart here because the S&P has actually broken down from a major consolidation wedge pattern. So this is the move since October. It was about, I think it was about 27% on the S&P 500. But look at how it got narrow and narrower connecting the lows and the highs. And recently, we've just broken down. So one of the reasons I think the stock market and the economy has held up as well as it has is because the stock market has been going higher at a breakneck pace. If you start to see the stock market coming down, all those people that saw their 401ks up 20%, 30%, they're going to say, uh-oh, you know, I can't spend as much money anymore. And I do think that then perpetuates an even faster move into a recession. And I think, by the way, I think that's one of the reasons why the economy has stayed strong and the Fed's been able to kind of hold back on cutting and why the Fed may have to cut a lot faster if the stock market takes, let's say, a 10% tumble or so. Right. I definitely, I was going to ask you, you know, why have we been able to hold on for so long? And that that kind of explains that. So I want to go back to gold. I think you mentioned earlier in this conversation, 2500 is looking pretty likely in 2024 and then longer term, perhaps 3000. So I wonder if we can look a little bit more in depth at that and show people where it could be going. Of course, after that, that pullback that you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. So so let's jump back into that gold chart and kind of take another look at some of the longer term projections that are based on the chart. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase these lines here and we're going to start from scratch, but we're going to keep it on the monthly. Well, you know what? Let's go back to the weekly chart. So the first thing is there's this pattern formation that's called an inverse head and shoulders. And the inverse head and shoulders is a very bullish pattern. And essentially what you get is this upside down person. It's kind of that's why it comes from is a head and shoulders of a person. So you can see it says on the screen where the head is, and here's your shoulder. Now, the kicker is this, right? So here's your shoulder, head, shoulder. What technical analysis allows us to do is to figure out where the target would be for this head and shoulders to complete. And when completion occurs, it, it usually is upwards here. So what we do, very simply, just so simple, take the lowest point of the head and shoot a line straight up to that what's called the neckline. It's this line that goes right across here. All right, that's 450 points. So what you do then is you say, okay, well, on the breakout, we should mimic that and go up 450 points on gold to our first target. And that brings us to that $2,500 play out. So that would be a completion of the head and shoulders, inverse head and shoulders pattern at just over 2,500. My guess is that happens this year. The reason why I say 3,000 is that because, and this is more of a fundamental side of things, is that it's very hard for me to envision how the Fed doesn't print more money, how the Fed doesn't, you know, the government doesn't take on more debt without massive austerity measures. And if you're going to see that printing continuing for, for let's say, the next five years, gold has to increase. More money in the system, the dollar ultimately in all currencies will weaken against gold, and gold should go even higher over that period. Okay, really good to get a look at that. And just briefly, I wondered if we could also take a look at gold stocks because, you know, people typically would expect them to outperform the gold price, which I don't think we're quite seeing yet. So what are what are you seeing when you look at the gold stocks charts? Yeah, so let's look at the GDX, in fact. So the GDX gives us the gold miners ETF. And, and so you can see right here is, and this is shorter term. So we're going to start shorter term and then we'll look at the longer term. So shorter term, you have two major trend lines that intersect a bunch of levels. And if you look at today's price action, we finally pierced that first line, almost getting to the second line. And look at how it's getting rejected. And this is called resistance, right? These are resistance lines, essentially that door, door that's locked and we can't get through it in price. Now, again, my guess is you'll see a pullback in price on the GDX, maybe down to about $34, uh, $32 here. So a $2 pullback, that'll bring us into major technical support here. And then I actually think we do start to make that next move up. And this is where we would then go to the bigger time frame and say, okay, what is the bigger 
pattern formation. And what's remarkable here is we actually have an inverse head and shoulders on this. It just hasn't broken yet, right? So if we look at this, it's that same pattern that gold has. It just, again, like you said, it's actually technically it has broken. Check that. It has broken out. And, and we can do that same measurement to the upside. So we take the lowest point, we shoot that line right up. It's a $17 move. And we do the same thing here. We shoot up $17 on the GDX and we basically get a target of $50. So, I mean, percentage-wise, that's an amazing move to the upside if you're long on the GDX. So short-term, I'm looking for a pullback. But longer term, as long as gold price outpaces inflation, the gold miners should flourish in that environment, meaning that they're selling gold for more than more and more than the cost that they're doing to run their business. Okay, very interesting to see that pattern retreat in there, but it does make sense. And so we're looking at GDX, which is the the big gold liners. And I remember in the past you've been more interested in those larger solid names in the gold space. I wonder, you know, people like the smaller gold companies because, of course, they can rise that much higher when when they start to move. Would you ever consider looking at at those ones? Yeah, so so I definitely would. Um, you know, I tend to at this stage of my career try to try to hit singles and doubles versus home runs. Um, so I kind of stay away from the smaller ones. But but my my thought is that if I ever do play the smaller miners, I go with something like the GDXJ, which spreads my risk amongst many gold miners, small miner, you know, the the tiny miners. And this way, if one, you know, I mean, really, what it comes down to is. If, if some of these smaller miners don't hit a big, you know, s supply of gold, they can go out of business because they're spending money to search for gold. And so, so for me, again, I don't like to take that risk of maybe I lose 100% or most of my money. So the GDXJ would be an interesting alternative to get an exposure to the smaller miners, but not take individual risk. Okay. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Of course, that is, yeah, a less risky way to do it. So Love to talk about gold, but we have to mention silver as well. And again, looking back to that conversation we had in December, you mentioned to us if silver could make it past 2550, I think that was when it would have really good upside. So, of course, we've done that. And I was looking today at the chart. I told you before we turned the camera on, I saw it above 28 and I had just a small heart attack there. So, silver, what, what is silver's potential looking like now in 2024, given those updated numbers? <laughs> Yeah. So, so again, what would I've been looking at was this wedge pattern and same thing, kind of an inverse head and shoulders right here. Right. And, and just want to show everyone, here's that 2550 level that we talked about right here. And once you got above it, look at the explosive move to 28, like you mentioned, right? So huge move to the upside on silver. Um, again, is it a little bit long in the tooth in the short term? Yeah. You might get a small pullback, but again, I, I continue to think that we're going to go up here and test $30 which is that key resistance from 2020. Once we get to 30, we have to reevaluate again. But but I do think, again, whether we get a small pullback or not, you're destined to go to $30. And down the line, if gold goes to $3,000, you are going to see silver go higher than $30 as well. Okay. Okay. So we will, we'll look at silver again once we make it to 30, and we'll see how it's going. Okay. Sounds good to me. We also, of course, we have to check in on Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is a market, as you know, I'm a little bit less familiar with what's going on there. But of course, I've seen the headlines, new all-time high in 2024. So for you, were you were you expecting this this year? Has the price action surprised you? Yeah, so there's no doubt price action on, on Bitcoin has, has surprised me a little bit. Um, you know, I think I underestimated how bullish the markets would be in la late last year as well as this year as well. And I think, to be honest, Bitcoin and, and the stock market are very intertwined as a risk asset. Eventually, I do view Bitcoin as a long-term digital gold. But right now, it goes up when the markets go up. It goes down when the stock market goes down. And so really, the, the combination of the stock market doing well really catapulted it. We also had the ETF, the spot ETF approval. We have the halving coming up. All of these are adding to that bull narrative. So really what we have here on the chart is a trend line that I'm watching. As long as you see this bottom trend line, how we keep on coming back to it, then bouncing, then hitting again and bouncing, as long as Bitcoin stays above this level, which is currently around 66,000, then to be honest, you could see further upside. And I think, again, a lot of that will be tied with does the stock market see further upside as well. Um, however, if 66,000 breaks to the downside, meaning this trend line breaks to the downside, then I would be very concerned that we would go back to about the 50-ish thousand level, somewhere in that vicinity. But but it's been an amazing move to the upside. It's holding relatively resilient, although granted the S&P is close to its all-time highs as well. 
Um, the big question for me is what happens if we do see a bigger stock market correction? How does Bitcoin hold up in that in that environment? <laughs> Very interesting. So so for you, at what level would you be a buyer of Bitcoin? So so basically, I'm I do expect at some point the stock market to pull back enough that that Bitcoin does crack this level. It could make new all time highs prior. But eventually, I do think this level gets broken. And then for me, it's looking back at the chart. And the chart tells us there's a couple major levels, right? So this would be a very interesting level at 52,000. We can see the sideways consolidation before the breakout. And then the, the high of the spot ETF approval was 49. And that would be a secondary zone. So anywhere between 52 and 49, that would be a very interesting level for a pullback where you would get a buying opportunity. Now, I do want to just caveat this with if the stock market gets into a massive bear market, let's say the stock market drops 30, 40, 50%, like we've seen in 2008, 2009, then Bitcoin's going a lot lower than 50, right? I mean, it's, it's only if, you know, if the stock market corrects 5, 10%, then yeah, 50-ish, give or take, is probably realistic. If we see, again, those bigger moves in the stock market, then I do think panic fills Bitcoin and you probably see it down to 30 or even sub 30. Okay, and I don't I don't think I've ever asked you this before, but with the new I don't think we've spoken since the spot Bitcoin ETFs were approved. I don't think I've ever asked you your preferred way to play in the Bitcoin market. So would you go for Bitcoin itself? Would you use one of these other vehicles? How how would you do that? Yeah, so so I think that's really to each individual in, individual investor has to decide. I mean, you know, there's risks and and positives and negatives. So number 1, if you buy an ETF that's based on spot, you know, technically the, the ETF is holding your Bitcoin for you, which if you're okay with that is fine. It lets you be in and be out and stay in a FDIC insured portfolio at a regular brokerage. You know, if you buy it on the spot exchanges, then you own that and you, you can take custody of that. But at the same time, you don't get FDIC insurance on those exchanges. So, so for me, you know, in this point in my career, I'm most likely playing it via the ETFs. But I do understand if like if I were to have a hodl position that I was going to hold for a long time, I would probably buy it off of the exchanges and kind of take it off the exchanges. Okay, so so like anything, it's each individual has to make their own decision. Okay, one final Bitcoin question, because we do have the having approaching any special considerations that people should be aware of as we head toward that. So the only thing I would point out about the having, you know, on social media, it gets made out to be something massive. But we are now down to only about two, 2 million Bitcoins left to mine out of 21 million. So yes, those Bitcoins are going to be harder to mine, doubly hard to mine, but it's only 2 million left now. And so there's still a 19 million supply that's out there amongst regular folks that can be bought or sold at any one time. And so I think it's important to kind of recognize that the halvings become less important over time. You know, when there is... 20 million Bitcoin or, or 15 million and a halving occurred, that made that was a huge reduction in the supply coming out. Now it's not so much because there's been so much mine. So so I think that again, whether we see the sell-off before the halving or after, I do think there is a sell-off coming and probably that retrace to 50,000 is likely. Okay. I think I think we've gone through many of the areas that I wanted to cover, but I'm wondering, just putting it back to you, are there any other areas of, of bullishness that you have in 2024 that we haven't discussed? Yeah, so so I think for me, you know, it's it's looking at some charts that, you know, on a shorter term basis are interesting. Um, you know, even like Tesla right now, everyone's been hating on it. Boeing's been hating on it. And, and listen, if the markets drop 20%, those are all going to go down as well. But at least in the shorter term, I always gravitate towards positions that, are very people have a very negative view short term on and I look for bounces on those but aside from that to be honest you know for me it's it's buying gold on pullbacks at this point buying silver buying palladium platinum like you know the major metals um just on that fundamental thought process that I do believe the Fed unfortunately for many of us will have to go back and all central banks they're going to all have to go back to printing and low interest rates to stimulate the economy at some point in the future Okay, I think that is a good place to wrap up unless you had any final advice that you would leave investors with or if you want to let people know where they could find you. Yeah, sure. And, and the first thing is always do your own research. Be aware you know, of all the stuff out there. There's lots of good information and do your own due diligence. And then, and then definitely check out the newverifiedinvesting.com website. It is filled. Like literally I built that homepage the way 
I want it for an investor and trader, meaning that we put everything on that homepage, like like the earnings reports coming out, the the economic news, various chart setups, fear and greed, like everything that you could ever want on one site instead of having to go to 10 sites is there. And I do encourage people just to come check it out. It's free. The homepage is free and there's lots of great information. So again, that's verifiedinvesting.com. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming on to talk about the markets and precious metals today. Always really good to have you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. So nice to see you. Of course. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com. And this is Garrett Soloway with verifiedinvesting.com. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'd also love to hear your thoughts, so leave us a comment below. We'll see you next time.